All right, welcome in everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for the Kernel in Space. I am Sal Kimmick. I am from the Confidential Computing Consortium, and we have Sal Kimmick. Uh, sorry, Sal Hastings here, Lord, representing Gadfly AI uh, and giving us a more sort of historical, uh, full-bodied approach to understanding uh, sort of software and the kernel in space. So as we prepare to take off, there's a couple of things that I want to cover around the context of what we're looking at. I wanted to explore the kernel in space and also why there is not as much kernel in space as you might expect and some of the constraints that have led to that and how that's changing. So to begin, before we go to the moon, I want to talk a little bit about open source and the kind of open source that gets engaged in space. So when we are talking about this, uh, so I would actually say this is not a software, so a software distribution, a software development distribution model. We're trying to uh, explore ways of communicating as much intellectual property as we can when we're solving hard problems. Uh, and some great examples of this are uh, programming languages like Python, Java, and things that you're very familiar with in this space like Git. We want to make sure that if we are using software that has an open source license that can be generally used, modified, and distributed. And then when we're distributing it, that we're going to distribute it under the same open source license. And about the Linux kernel, this slide is probably one that we may not need for this crowd, but for anyone who is not as familiar. We're going to be looking at the Linux kernel specifically, the core component of the operating system, and all of the tools and extrapolations from that in this space. And then secondarily, there's the Linux Foundation. So this is the nonprofit that we are all here to discuss the projects from, uh, where we are aiming at the resources and infrastructure and collaborative platforms for the Linux development space. And we exist as an antitrust. I think that this is particularly interesting. We think a lot about corporate corporations, but there are also many institutions that engage in open source. And I myself come from the open science background and the culture that comes from sharing code under open science collaboration practices. And I think both of those contribute to the distribution model in this space. So now it's time to explore space technology. Before we jump into the history, there's a couple of things that we can talk about in this space, what we have to think about um, when developing the hardware and software, and some things that we've learned from the stories that you're just about to hear from. One of the most important things that is different about development in space versus Earth is particularly the fact that these systems are suspect to radiation. I enjoy thinking about developing in this space because I have to think about developing redundancy or computing systems that are able to handle random bit flips changes. This becomes really important when we're thinking about the consequences of putting anything that is AI or ML in space because they already have statistical probability layers in them that can be impacted. Um, we want to be really careful about our redundant computing. I'm giving you some of the basic and older examples because we're covering mostly the history of what we've learned. And I think really what we've learned in the history and future of redundant computing is just getting better and better about putting redundancies in with less hardware. Moving to solutions, right, we're much more likely we're always going to be using DMR over TMR now, but software redundancy systems are developing as well. We're being very careful in this space about developing fault isolation techniques, memory protection mechanisms. Um, we want to be very careful about isolation here and module kernel, module isolation. Um, this is not so much in terms of cybersecurity, but this is in order to protect against uh, faults and physical compromises. Uh, and if you are a developer here who's maybe a hobbyist or someone who just wants to get engaged with the ways that we are building with the Linux kernel on Earth, a couple of things that I think are really interesting to consider. Um, you could be contributing to the Wurpel kernel, uh, which is for hyperspectral imaging of spacecraft anomalies, um, open project that you can look at today to get a better understanding of how to build an efficient compute platform for this as well. And then one thing that I came across just last week uh, is someone who has been out communicating generally to the open science community, and I came across them while I was looking at uh, current science research. Tony Fast is actually giving a very interesting approach of if we're building open science and open source in this space, are we doing it in a way that 
we are allowing everyone to actually engage if it's things as simple as being able to use our telescopes and the documentation beneath those. I want to highlight this in part because uh, they're probably going to be up in Bellingham in, uh, at the Linux Fest Northwest next week. But also I like the questions that they ask because I'm looking at this space particularly because it's where we have to look at long-tailed forward-looking questions and uh, making sure that we're sending things out that we're able to repair. Um, but I love the idea of this one question in the center, uh, and I think this is just as true for open source as it is for open science. Um, some of y'all are early in your career. If you are lucky, you'll be seeing the fruits of your labor 50 years from now. You'll be a different person with different access needs. How are you going to experience this when you get older? And I think that that's as true for our documentation in this space as it is for space documentation. So with that, I'm going to take a step back and we're going to take a really interesting journey through the history of technology in space. Thank you, Sal. Okay, just a second here. Just turn my phone off here. Okay. Excellent. Time for the history lesson. Okay, so we have to talk about the history of computers in space to sort of get to the present tense of computers in space. But back in the beginning, it wasn't really computers in space. It was more generally technology in space. And, and actually, at the very beginning, it was, it was literally just putting stuff in space. So let's start at the very beginning which in this case is April 5th of 1950, where Lloyd V. Berkner, who's an electrical engineer with an interest in the atmospheric propagation of radio waves and the ionosphere, uh, receives a phone call from James Van Allen, who said that Professor Sidney Chapman had just arrived in town and they should basically all meet up and talk about geophysics because they're geophysicists. And one of the really frustrating things about geophysics is that it's very difficult, at least in 1950, to just like zoom out and look at Earth as a whole, as you can do when looking at other planets with a telescope. Uh, this necessitated in years past events like the first and second international polar years of 1882 and 1932, where basically the community would internationally go out and measure stuff everywhere, including the poles, just to get a general idea about the general Earth phenomena, essentially. So uh, what spawned out of this conversation uh, was him eventually proposing a third international polar year at the Mixed Commission on the Ionosphere of the International Council of Scientific Unions in the June of 1950, which was in Brussels. Uh, the ICSU rubber stamped it in October of 1951 to happen in 1957 to 1958 because it just takes six years to organize these things. And um, in the latter half of 1952, it actually got rebranded as the uh, International Geophysical Year, or IGY. And on July 29th of 1955, James E. Agerty, the press secretary to the Eisenhower administration, announced that America was going to participate in the IGY by launching a, a satellite, or multiple satellites, actually. And uh, a few years later, on October 4th of 1957, at approximately 7 p.m., According to this unclassified CIA report, uh, Lloyd Berkner was standing around at a cocktail party for the IGY and satellite conference that was being held at the Soviet embassy in Washington, D.C., when a New York Times reporter, who just got gotten off the phone, scurries in and whispers something in his ear. Dr. Berkner then makes the following announcement. I wish to make an announcement. I am informed by the New York Times that a satellite is in orbit at an elevation of 900 kilometers, or 559 miles. I wish to congratulate our Soviet colleagues on this achievement. And so, on October 4th, 1957, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the space race begins. Now, the satellite in question, SP-1, 
later called uh, Sputnik, or which I believe is the Russian uh, phrase for fellow traveler, was a minimum effort satellite proposed after the initial plans for the larger Object D satellites that had begun development, that had begun development in 1956 faced some setbacks. Now, I don't speak or read Russian, so I relied on the translation provided by Dr. Asif Siddiqui to NASA's historical archives. Uh, all other uh, documents that are in Russian have been uh, machine translated. So the major components of this 83-kilogram satellite consisted of a battery pack, the large gray thing in the center, a cooling fan, that shiny horn piece on top, and that black thing uh, labeled with number two, which is an electromagnetic mechanical relay, as well as the D200, a one-watt radio transmitter that sat in the middle of the battery pack and emitted alternating beeps at 20 and 40 megahertz, respectively, which are detectable even by amateur radio operators on the planetary surface. Uh, for those curious, here is the schematic and the Bill of Materials, courtesy of a 1958 report that was republished by RKS, or Russian Space Systems, on the 60th anniversary of the Sputnik launch in 2017. Now, the D200 weighed only a few kilograms and measured approximately 425 by 132 by 93 millimeters, or in terms of scale, was about that big. It required active cooling above 30 degrees Celsius, hence the fan blowing on top of it, and it had an expected uptime of two weeks with the uh, silver oxide batteries that surrounded it. Uh, in total, I think the transmission lasted about 21 days. The satellite itself finally deorbited in January of 1958. The total transistor count was zero because it was vacuum tube based. Um, funnily enough, at the end of the report, uh, the RKS does basically concede that it's like, yeah, you know, transistors are kind of a thing, and if we were to do this again, we should, should probably do it with transistors. Uh, it's also not a computer, but it was the first electronic thing in space, and it was the first thing in space that we intentionally put there. Obviously, as time went on, the USSR, and then, of course, later the Russian Federation, continued to, both, to develop both satellites and human manned spacecraft, with the Soyuz line enjoying use up to around the present day as the transport vehicle to and from the ISS. Um, after NASA decommissioned the shuttle in 2011, we've just been riding the Soyuz until more recently with, uh, the SpaceX, with SpaceX, obviously. Now, um, Research of Soviet-era space technology has proven to be an absolute chore, not only due to the language barrier, but um, due to um, the current socio-political climate. So I would like to pivot now and focus on US-developed space technology, and in no small part because I can heavily lean on the absolutely wonderful 400-plus page report uh, the NASA Contractor Report 182505, a.k.a. Computers in Spaceflight, the NASA Experience, by Dr. James E. Tomyako, published in 1988 after four and a half years of research and editing. From this, we can learn an absolute ton about the development life cycle of computers built by NASA and its contractors. So, first off, let's do a brief summary of computers in manned spaceflight, starting with Mercury. Mercury didn't have a computer. It's basically remote control from the ground, aside from some attitude adjustment subsystems. All of the reentry math, all the cool stuff was calculated on the ground. As such, the report doesn't have much to say about it. So we're, we're not going to talk about it. Um, now on to Gemini. The Gemini digital computer was contracted by IBM for NASA for an initial $26.6 million in 1962, adjusted for inflation that is just over 270 million US dollars today. The computers themselves, IBM wound up delivering 20 of them, uh, were 18.9 by 14.5 by 12.75 inches and weighed about 60 pounds. Sorry, what? Uh, this was built in America. Those are the real numbers. Also, the next guy speaking is from IBM, so you can, you can ask him. Um, they were built with discrete transistors and used core memory for program storage, the total capacity of which was 159,744 bits, divided as 4,096 addresses of 39-bit words across 39 planes of 64 by 64-bit arrays. Uh, there is a physical diagram of the memory layout. In later missions, when more program space was needed, 
An auxiliary tape drive was sourced from Raymond Engineering Laboratories of Middletown, Connecticut. It took up about 700 cubic inches of space, weighed 26 pounds, and it held about 1.1 million bits of data, and it took six minutes to load a program from tape into the core memory. Uh, in order to counteract the tape's inherent bit error rates, each program was recorded on the tape three times and passed through a voting circuit. I believe that this is actually the first instance of TMR, or triple modular redundancy, used in space hardware. Now let's talk about software. Programs are written by hand using the computer's limited instruction set, uh, although uh, without the use of a high-level language, although programs were written in Fortran to validate its behavior and run simulations. So um, seriously underestimating the amount of storage needed for flight programming is a uh, recurring theme in the development of space computers and is what encouraged modularization and aggressive optimization of flight programming and later on just, you know, buying the tape drive. Um, there were a number of versions of software of, used on the Gemini missions. Uh, they were called Gemini MathFlow. But uh, so to summarize here, uh, MathFlow 1 had four modules, Ascent, Catch, catch Up, Rendezvous, and Reentry. They wanted to add orbital navigation and reentry initialization to MathFlow 2, but it was too big for available memory, so they canned it. But in MathFlow 4, they were able to add the reentry initialization. However, it took up almost all available space in memory, and a NASA directive in February of 1964 changed the type of bank angle used in the reentry mode. So they changed the bank angle for MathFlow 5, uh, but once Again, that was too big for available memory, so they fell back to a modified MathFlow 3 for Gemini spacecraft 3 and 4, and finally moved to MathFlow 6 for spacecraft 5 through 7. Um, for spacecraft, what is that, um, 9 through 11, they used the auxiliary tape memory, and they had uh, in total six program modules with nine operation modes. So we have executor, executor pre-launch, ascent, catch-up, rendezvous, and re-entry. There we go. Now, the control interfaces used in Gemini uh, consisted of some switches to control the operation of the computer. We had a velocity readout, and we had an interface, like a keypad, to literally access and interact with memory addresses. Uh, generally, stuff worked pretty well, uh, but it's worth mentioning that the computers had no redundancy whatsoever. I mean, I guess there was the TMR thing as part of the tape drive, but there was no, I guess you could call it computational redundancy. Uh, they, they relied entirely on the software for error correction. Moving on to Apollo. The Apollo guidance computer was contracted by NASA to MIT, presumably due to their success with the Polaris missile. In fact, it was basically the same team from MIT that wound up working on Apollo. So the initial Block 1 design was based off the original Polaris design, but Block, block 2, which is what wound up actually shipping, was actually based off discrete integrated circuits. But not like a whole variety of them, it was literally just NOR gates. Um, this apparently led to the Apollo program consuming 60% of the total U.S. output of microcircuits by mid-1963. In terms of physical specifications, it measured uh, 24 by 12 and a half by 6 inches, weighed just over 70 pounds, and consumed 70 watts at 28 volts DC. Here it is with the uh, DSKY, or DISKY, which is the control interface, your screen and your keypad there. Um, the missions actually used two of these. Uh, one was in the control module, and one was in the lander, and they were both identical. In terms of memory, the original design from 1962 proposed by MIT had 4K of 16-bit words of fixed memory. We can think of that as program storage, and 256 words of erasable memory. You can think of that in this context as RAM, effectively. Um, that later increased to uh, 10K of fixed and 1K of erasable by the summer of 1963. And then to 12K with MIT swearing up and down that they could keep it under 16K for even an autonomous lunar mission. And then again to 24K. And finally to 36K with 2K of erasable. This is again because writing software is hard. Estimating the size of software is even harder, and NASA wasn't super specific about the requirements initially, and then, of course, just kept 
changing them. Now, the, the erasable memory was pretty standard core memory, but, oh boy, the read-only stuff was something called core rope, which is the same idea as core memory, but done as rope, which does give it higher storage density, but it makes it a pain in the butt to manufacture and kind of impossible to reprogram because, so the way that data is literally written on this is you have a bunch of wires and you thread them through magnetically charged cores. And so if you thread it through a core, that's a one. And if you skip a core, that's a zero. So, I mean, they literally had to figure out the program eight, 10 months, a year ahead of time so that Raytheon could go and build it. Uh, in total, there were six modules of core, core rope containing 6,144 16-bit words. Okay, software time. So the Apollo computers used a priority interrupt system with queues, uh, whereby jobs lasting longer than four milliseconds would be moved from the wait list uh, to the executive, uh, which checked every 20 milliseconds for jobs with a higher priority and was also in charge of upgrading the disk displays and doing memory management. Now, due to memory size constraints, the executive would actually overbook memory addresses when it was assumed that the owning processes wouldn't collide. As you can imagine, this caused some hilarity during development. Uh, in terms of the actual programs themselves, uh, MIT actually developed a bytecode interpreter to speed up development time and decrease the total program storage required. This, of course, being at the uh, expense of performance. Um, system freezes were mitigated uh, by use of restart mechanisms that could be triggered by a variety of situations, including they actually had a watchdog called Night Watchman. Now, this was actually incredibly important because the, si the system prioritized counter instruction, counter uh, increments over executing regular instructions. And, uh, well, during the Apollo 11 mission, the rendezvous radar made so many increment requests that it slowed everything down. The system had to restart several times, like three times, within 40 seconds, while Apollo 11 was descending to the lunar surface. Now, in terms of the actual software development support cycle, it was the same standard game of changing requirements, leading to uh, running out of program space, leading to more complex methods, leading to weird bugs, leading to setbacks, leading to adding more people to the development team, the mythical man month. And uh, that just slowed things down even more. I, I believe the total number of developers peaked at 400 by August of 1968. And, and, and just to give you an idea of how bad this is, I want to read to you verbatim this section from Computers in Space Flight, entitled Flight AS-204, A Breaking Point. Despite efforts by both MIT and NASA, by the summer of 1966, flight schedules and problems in development put both organizations in a dangerous position regarding the software. A study of the programs encountered with the software for Flight AS-204, which was to be the first manned Apollo mission, best demonstrates this urgency. On June 13th, Tinder reported that the AS-204 program undergoing integrated tests had bugs in every module. Some had not been unit tested prior to being integrated. This was a serious breach of software engineering practice. If individual modules are not unit tested and proven bug free, then bugs found in integrated tests are most likely located in the interfaces or calling modules. If unit testing has not been done, then the bugs could be anywhere in the program load, and it is very difficult to identify the location properly. This vastly increases the time and thus the cost of debugging. It causes a much greater slip in schedule than time spent on unit tests. Even worse, Tyndall said that the test results would not be formally documented to NASA, but they would be on file if needed. Now, uh, what this boiled down to is that flight AS-204 would fly with known bugs. Now, apparently, nothing in here was so bad that it couldn't be worked around. And by worked around, I mean that in January of 19 1967, they realized that the timing calculation for the orbit, for the re orbit burn was so incredibly wrong, like off by over 150 seconds wrong, that they were just going to ignore it and use a solution calculated on the ground. <sighs> AS-204 never flew, of course, because on January 28th of 1967, during a manned simulation, 
The control module caught fire on the launch pad, killing everyone on board and delaying the whole program by several months. This did, however, afford NASA and MIT enough time to get something of decent quality out. Sunburst, which was the program load, was fully qualified and ready to go by October, a full year before Apollo 7 flew with it in 1968. All of this led to the creation of the uh, Guidance Software Task Force in December of 1967. They met a total of 14 times before creating their final report in September of 1968. And the re final report wasn't like crazy either. It was basically just recommending consistent variable naming uh, and you know, actually allocating sufficient resources to software development. <clears throat> oh, uh, I almost forgot to mention, we should probably talk about the control interface, the DISCI. A typical mission apparently required 10 and a half thousand keystrokes using a verb noun system. You could select, run, and interact with various programs. It was apparently quite well received in terms of usability after a lot of hours of training. Uh, and, and, and oh, actually, uh, the Apollo did have some redundancy in the form of the abort guidance system or AGS. Uh, it was a totally custom architecture created by TRW. It was called the Marco Man Rated Computer uh, 4418. It was 5 by 8 by 23.75 inches, weighed 32.7 pounds, and needed 90 watts to operate it. And you can see the uh, control interface there. The machine was 18 bit, and I think it had 2 kilo words, so that would be 2,000 by 18 bits of fixed, and the same of erasable, but not RAM because the memory was serial access. Development was a chore because they kept running out of space. Uh, and it actually had its own totally separate sensors and, and display interface. It was, it was com completely separate. And um, we never actually used it for an abort because Apollo never had to abort. It was, however, useful as a backup source of guidance info for Apollo 11 during the whole rendezvous radar denial of service. And, you know, Apollo 13, when it um, <clears throat> exploded and we had to crawl into the lunar module for warmth. Uh, they had to turn the big computer off, but we still had the small computer and we could use that. So. so what we've learned here is that more computers, having backups is, is pretty useful. Uh, for further reading, I recommend that as well as that. All right, let's talk about Skylab. Skylab was the United States' first space station. It used a completely off-the-shelf computer from IBM's 4Pi series. This is a spin on their whole 360 thing. It was called the TC-1, and it was this weird 16-bit thing embedded for, uh, intended for embedded military applications. And like, I was pretty good, actually. Uh, NASA finally got their act together in terms of figuring out their requirements ahead of time, and IBM poured blood, sweat, and tears into rigidly structuring the development of the software load, and it was also a pretty small team which minimized communication headaches. <sighs> they ran out of space again and, you know, had to make some cuts and optimizations, but like, you know, what else is new? Uh, they had this uh, really cool, had a big program that was real time and it did all kinds of cool multitasking and priorities and interrupts and stuff. That is a diagram of the program cycle. Uh, they also had a small program, which was 8K, which was like a bare minimum fallback for basic attitude control. And, and I'm, I'm going to gloss over a bunch of stuff with Skylab because there, there's not a whole lot to talk about because they basically did a good job. They had, they had you know, DMR. They had two uh, run-on computers with, you know, failover and uh, a tape backup. And, and it just, I mean, it just ran by itself with very little human intervention. And on February 9th of 1974, when we left Skylab, we turned it off. Um, we expected the orbit of Skylab to decay pretty slowly, like it was going to be a problem in like the mid-1980s. And before then, we would have the shuttle working, and we could just go out there and just kind of push it back up. Um, but then solar stuff happened and the atmosphere changed density, and Skylab's orbit started decaying much faster than originally expected. So we needed to change its orientation to lower the drag coefficient and keep it in the sky longer. And, and what I mean, literally, like, one of the things we needed to do is we needed to make it face pointy and forward to minimize drag, but we also had to implement a completely different attitude control scheme, lots of kinematics and... and all that stuff. So uh, this was a huge chore, but in March of 1978, 
after being off for four years and 30 days, we turned it back on. And it started right back up where it left off, as if it had just suffered a momentary power blip. OK, so then we started to work on the software to reorient and control Skylab, except, um, yeah, so we couldn't find all of the software tooling that we used. And um, IBM had just deleted the last of the source code for the flight programs. And NASA couldn't find one of the tapes for the simulation software. Uh, so uh, a very small team, uh, sometimes I think as little as four people, I believe, because the documentation is a little bit fuzzy here, uh, we had like one of the listings for one of the flight programs on punch cards. And so they sort of hacked at that, and we ran some minimal simulations because they were the only simulations we could run. And we uploaded it to Skylab slowly in pieces over several months as we continued to adjust our math and simulations. Uh, we were eventually able to very carefully deorbit Skylab over the mostly uninhabited parts of planet Earth. Just to give you an idea, the manned portion of Skylab's life was like something like 260 days. The unmanned portion, where we were just sort of trying to keep it up in the sky, was something like 393 days. But I should probably come clean at this point um, because there's, if you've noticed, uh, we've spent the last 25 minutes now not talking about Linux in space. And um, there's a very simple reason for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, OK. So like, it technically is, but it hasn't been here for very long. I mean, it's like technically, it's on board the ISS. Some or all of the terminals you use to interact with the space station subsystems run Linux. Um, but uh, look. Nothing in space really is using Linux for like attitude control, and, and there's good reasons for this. If I can summarize anything about the last 25 minutes, it's that, well, you know, partially because it's, it's literal rocket science, and also because this should hopefully come as no surprise to anyone in the room. And uh, let's face it, I mean, we've only been writing Linux for, what, 30 years? And, okay, so there's this, com there's this common misconception that NASA wants the latest and greatest bleeding edge stuff, but nothing could be further from the truth. Dr. Tomyako mentions this at the end of his report, and actually the reviewers of his report thought that it was important enough that they restated it in the foreword. Um, but it's essentially this. NASA never asked for anything that could not be done with current technology, but in response, the computer industry sometimes pushed itself just a little in a number of areas. Just a little bit better software development practices made onboard software safe. Just a little bit better networking made the launch processing system more efficient. Just a little bit better operating system made mission control easier. Just a little bit better chip makes image processing faster. NASA did not push the state of the art, but nudged it enough times to make a difference. And pushing the envelope is really really expensive, especially when you're trying to do it in a vertically integrated fashion. In order for Linux to be considered for use in space, it needs to be safe. It, it needs to be boring, which is why we should probably talk about why Linux is on Mars. OK, let's talk about ingenuity. Ingenuity. Civil registration number IGY, because it's a helicopter, uh, is a small, solar-powered, remotely controlled helicopter that was deployed to the Martian surface on April 3rd of 2021 from the belly of the Perseverance ro rover. Um, and uh, <laughs> what's really cool is that somebody at JPL has already done a wonderful presentation about it as part of the FISO uh, Future in Space Operations Telecon a couple years ago. Uh, Oh, there is a link to it. It's fantastic. And I am going to commandeer some slides from it. So 
the major takeaway from this is right in the name there. It is, it's a technology demonstration. The intention was not, we're going to do a drone on Mars. It's like, can we fly on Mars? Now, uh, Mars does have lower gravity than Earth, so that should theoretically make things easier. But the Martian atmosphere is extremely thin, and trying to fly a helicopter there is like trying to fly a helicopter on Earth, but at an altitude of 100,000 feet. Some, nobody, nobody's done that before. Uh, Mars is also really, really cold, like negative 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And so not only did they need to size the batteries to just like spin the propellers really, really fast, uh, but they also had to size them to run the heaters to keep it from freezing. Uh, NASA deployed what I like to call the reverse Sputnik configuration. Uh, whereby they have a thin candy-like shell of circuit boards surrounding a uh, uh, rich nougaty center of just batteries. Uh, actually, the battery pack is so massive, it's like, it, it literally is the majority of the weight of the helicopter is just batteries. As for the electronics themselves, well, um, broadly, uh, they're using Zigbee for wireless communication to the rover. And uh, in terms of the actual application processor, whatever you want to call it, um, it's a cell phone. They're using a Qualcomm Snapdragon running Linux. And, and well, well, why are they doing that? Well, they only had like $80 million to play with, which is, again, before, you know, at the beginning, the Apollo mission had what? 270 adjusted for today. Um, when you need cheap stuff, you just go to the store. You buy stuff off the shelf. Uh, and so we're going to talk about COTS now. All right. Um, I wanted to get that really in-depth history because I think we need to understand some of these constraints. I'm going to go through them real fast. So there's a couple of things that we are learning about cybersecurity and beyond that. I think we just learned, I think, the thing that we need to think about. COTS are an Earth concept, but I think maybe we need to start thinking about this more so in software as well, right? If I am going to get a commercial off the shelf, it has to be reliable, standard, and cost effective. And we're now seeing our first examples of space technologies, right? Something sitting on Mars that is entirely available from COTS, this. Our microprocessors, our communication systems, our power systems, all of these things are COTS available. Cryptographic modules, if I had a little bit more time, I might talk a little bit more on this, but one thing that I do want to consider here today, this is a little bit speculative, but I also want us to consider not just what we are bringing out into space, but how we're handling the data when we bring it back down. Is it sensitive? Is it potentially sensitive? Do we want to be careful about protecting that on ground? And so we got a couple of minutes for questions. I want to cover some of the things that you might be thinking about. AI, ML in space. Should we do it? Can we do it? There are better sort of AI and ML embedded systems coming out for computation, but really our limiting problem here is the risk of radiation. If you've already got a system that has stochasticity to it, if you put it in a radiation-filled environment, you're never going to know if it's a bit flip or if it is something in the model in which you're trying to discover. Quantum in space, again, it's a nice thought, it's an idea, but again, a lot of the quantum that would be available at this size is absolutely theoretical. Um, and the cooling and or heating requirements, depending on where you are positioned in space, are going to make this almost impossible for several decades, 
and also quantum attacks. So this is something that we should be worried about. Um, I would say this is still a long ways out in terms of something that we should be looking at, although there are other uh, areas of cybersecurity that we may want to be considering in this space. I want to leave us on a little bit of a broad note because it's been really interesting for me to jump back into a space which is really more hardware and uh, uh, hardware supply chain driven. driven. Um, there's a lack of hardening because if you're going with COTS, no other condition needs this. But it's also interesting to consider that this is one area of engineering that might be pushing us to create technology that is better for conditions here on Earth, right? Um, space systems operate in some of the most extreme environments. And I think if we start to design or if we pay attention to the players in the open source and open hardware space that have the cons these constraints, we can build better. And why I'm looking at this space is because I think people think differently here. We're definitely not thinking in the sort of like two year turnover uh, space of software. I think that open source is a place that I've always come to because it's about sharing knowledge respectfully so that we can see the benefits of that in the world. And we've seen that happen in space for decades. And as we continue to look at this space, and as you continue to see, is there a space where your projects or your contributions to projects can have an impact? I like to think about this now. Where in open source are you going to have the most long-tailed solutions, and where can you have a massive impact? So as we return to orbit, one of the things that I'm thinking about here is how we do uh, confidential computing here on Earth. If you have an interest in this, and I hope you do, come at 3.45 today, and Mike Bursell and I will be giving a talk right on this subject, and you can get a better understanding of that. If you are still in Washington State uh, next week or the end of this month, uh, Gadfly will be hosting the game night for Linux Fest Northwest, where we will be celebrating the one-year anniversary of the... Cyberscape zine, if you haven't seen this yet, this was one in which we have a special on AI and there's a special on, uh, there's a whole article on NASA's AI initiative there. So I think we're very much at time, but uh, any questions? Yeah, um, it's it's a little, so we know a bit about, obviously, F prime because they've, uh, NASA, or I guess more properly, JPL, has open sourced that, um, which is their framework for building, I don't know, Space a high level framework for building space stuff. I think it's I think it's mostly like C or C plus plus something like that. Um, the un <laughs> fortunately, um, I can't speak a whole lot past that because we don't know a whole lot else about the actual software stack running on the running on Ingenuity. We know that it's running Linux. Um, we know that it's running a Qualcomm Snapdragon processor. Uh, Presumably, we know that um, one of the large sort of technical leads for this project was a company that makes drones for the U.S. military, which is like, okay, well, that makes sense. It's a drone. It's in space. So presumably, they're reusing a lot of their technology stack. Um, but unfortunately, I can't speak uh, a whole lot in terms of uh, F prime as a whole. Absolutely. So I'll take this one. Um, so that was one of my more speculative slides, and I even wanted to put an asterisk in it, but I think it's it's not so speculative that it's not worth talking about. 
Um, so really, in the confidential computing space, you're going to see uh, two different things. You may be familiar with TEEs, right? Trusted execution environments, and then you will have an embedded space, something that it's often referred to as an enclave. Um, and those are two very different approaches in spaces. Uh, you, the confidential computing, right? It's, it's where we're in an instance where we've got sensitive data and a sensitive algorithm potentially, or at least one of each of those conditions. Um, this is a space where, I mean, with this technology, uh, hardware and hard, uh, the sort of isolation techniques are generally not oriented at this because you're not doing the kind of computation that you would be, very, very limited computation, right, as we discussed some of the limitations of compute in space at this time. However, um, for the data that is coming back down, um, I haven't seen anything in this space that def necessitates confidential computing. However, conditions like potentially uh, data that is giving us uh, weather conditions or sort of global weather conditions, those might be confidentially computed in the future uh, for specific sort of weather concerns or weather weaponry concerns. But Mike Bursell is going to answer this question and also come to our talk at 345. Yes, I, and Mike Bursell wrote the, boat, the book on confidential computing, so come to the talk at 345. <laughs> This one's for me. <laughs> um, yeah, so I find this space really exciting. And actually, it was like perfect timing, and your question is spot on, right? So it's kind of a space where I've always been. So I originally started in aviation. I did two years like with Boeing beforehand. And really, that regulatory space looks and feels a lot different than software has. <laughs> um, and I think, I think what we've learned from spaces that are critical, right? The plane cannot fall out of the sky. We're putting down some of the codified language for those expectations right now without perhaps an understanding of how exactly the supply chain is radically different or not, right? That's a, that's a consideration. Um, the one thing that I'll say in this is that nobody really knows how best to handle this right now. And one of the things that I've seen which I'm interested in is just two weeks ago in DC, the IAPPs, so these are privacy lawyers, had their first meeting around privacy and aviation and DOD um, because they're feeling the pressure of this and I don't know exactly how to handle it. So I think that's a question that I might have an answer to in a year uh, because I'm not a regulator, so I'll have to ask them, right? I think we should. Oh, one more. Second. Yeah, you, when you were talking about the insecurity, you mentioned that you yeah, had like off the shelf mm -hmm. security. Do you have any information on like what sort of memory you use it? Like, is this like off the shelf DRM also? Uh, I, I believe so. The, the high level, because there's, there's unfortunately, NASA has a great um, technical repository of, of documents. And not a lot of that stuff about ingenuity has hit that. Like, uh, again, one of the most technical things I could find was literally just that, that slideshow. I've basically seen it described as a high level, uh, from a high level of basically having off the shelf stuff at its core, like the Snapdragon or whatever, which is absolutely not radiation hardened, and having a couple of radiation hardened peripherals. Essentially, but actually, some of the, I mean, literally, actually, the, the LIDAR sensor on the bottom, the uh, range finding sensor, is literally, it's a Garmin part, but it's literally a part that they bought from SparkFun for 130, yeah. <laughs> so, just like, that's the level of stuff that we're playing with here, generally in terms of the construction of Ingenuity. Obviously, the motors were hand-wound, and, you know, everything else is carbon fiber and whatever, but... <laughs> 